Uh, thank you, Andrew, for praying. Uh, we have completed the fourth verse of the sixth chapter of Romans. And uh, since the continuity between fourth and fifth verse, I'll again go back to the fourth verse. And by the way, welcome you all again to our Bible study. And this very exciting chapter, these are six, seven, and eight of Romans on how to deal with sin, how to have victory over sin. The Apostle Paul had a problem with sin and he overcame that by the power of God. I'm going to look at that and learn from ourselves how we can be, live a victorious Christian life, even as we understand the resources God has given us uh, to live for him. In 2 Peter 1, 3, we read, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. To be godly, he has given us the resources we all need. So all of us can choose to be godly, choose to live a holy life, choose to follow Jesus. And the fourth verse of Romans 6, we discussed on, uh, on Friday. Uh, it speaks about how we are buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So as we went into the water in baptism, we identified with the death of Christ, buried with him, as you put in a tomb, and as he rose from the dead on the third day, when he come out of the water, it's a pledge, a symbolic of a new life in Christ. That's why baptism, biblical baptism, really has meaning only when we go into the water and come out of the water. Old self buried, new self coming out of the water, we're a new creation in Christ. Let's go on from verse 5. If we have been united with him like this in his death, mean like this meaning in baptism, uh, having believed in Christ, we become a believer in Christ, uh, having accepted him as Savior of the Lord. Thereafter, as an act of obedience, we get baptized. Immersion baptism is uh, basically an act of obedience after we become disciples. We discussed on, uh, on Friday how uh, the Great Commission in 28th chapter of Matthew, verse 19, includes going to end the world, preaching the gospel, making disciples, and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then teaching them to obey what he has commanded. That's the order. Go, preach, make disciples, baptize, teach. So it's an integral part of the Great Commission. And we get baptized to obey the teachings of Jesus. And it's symbolic of being buried with him in baptism. When you get when you put in a tomb, a whole self is buried. We come out of the water as a new creation in Christ. So here he says, if you be united with him in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his direction. He is a living God. He is resurrected. When you come out of the water, it's a decision to live for him. And he helps us to live for him. He is a helper in our temptations. Hebrews 2.18 says, Because he himself suffered while being tempted, he is able to help those being tempted. Also, in the fourth chapter of uh, Hebrews 15.16, we read, We don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we are one who stepped in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Therefore, let's approach the throne against the conference. They may receive mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. When we are tempted, we have a need to resist temptation. To resist temptation, we have a high priest already gone through all that. Every temptation we face today, he faced, he was victorious. He was sinless. And therefore, he's able to help us who are tempted, he gives us grace and mercy in our time of need. So coming out of the water, it's a decision to live for Jesus, his resurrected Lord, risen Lord, alive today, a helper, empowerer, comforter. He helps us to live a holy life today. Okay. Verse 6. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, 
Because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. How powerful these are. We are dead to sin. We were once slaves to sin. Now we are slaves of Christ. We choose to become slaves of Christ. And we have been delivered. In Romans chapter 8, in verse 32, he told the Jews, You will know the truth. Truth will set you free. And they respond by saying, We are Abraham's descendants. and have been slaves of anybody. And Jesus says, He who sins is a slave to sin. Before we turned to Christ, we were slaves to sin. We are in bondage. But now we have been set free from that sin. And we are set free to serve God joyfully. And we have become slaves of Christ today. A choice we make to become slaves of Christ. I was sharing the other day, if you remember, that while the Lord told his disciples, I no longer call you slaves or servants, I call you friends. He meant that whatever he heard from the Father, he made known to them. So many people ask this question, am I a friend of God or am I a slave of God? No longer a slave, but a friend. Actually, it's like this. As friends of Jesus, we listen to his instructions, wait for him to share his concerns with us. And as he shares his concerns with us, as he confides with us and gives us instruction, we go about fulfilling that instruction like a slave. First friend and then a slave. Focusing on God's will for our lives. So very simple. Both are true. Friends and slaves. That's what Paul says in Romans 1.1. 1, 1, I, Paul, a slave of Christ, called to be an apostle. So now, having come to believe in Christ, we are dead to sin. You see, a dead body, once it is, when a person dies, the body is lying there. You poke the body, you kick the body, nothing happens. No response. Dead to the world. Similarly, we are called to be dead to sin. And in uh, uh, Galatians 5.24, Paul writes, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with his passions and desires. Belongs to Christ means Christian. Christian means belongs to Christ. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the sinful nature with his passions and desires. So therefore, we should understand we have been set free and therefore we can choose to live a life of holiness, of obedience, for which God gives the resources we need. He gives us his word, which sanctifies us. John 17, 17. He gives us his spirit, who sanctifies us. First Peter chapter 1, verse 2. He gives us faith, by which we obey God joyfully. Romans 1, 5 says, obedience comes from faith. He's given us everything we need. It's a, just a choice we have to make uh, to choose to follow him. Verse 8. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we'll also live with him. Died to Christ means, you know, your past life, old self is buried, and we live a new life. We'll also live with him. He helps us to live for him. It says in Hebrews 2.11, he was holy with Christ, and who makes men holy is of the same family. So he's called us his brothers. They are called brothers of Jesus. Can you imagine? He is holy and who makes men holy. But the resource he gives us. If only we look to him and cry out to him for uh, righteousness in terms of living rightly before him, he will surely answer our prayers. Our old self is buried. Now, in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Paul writes, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. What is oldest and what is newest is not specified or uh, you know, expounded by Paul in this particular verse. But in the letter to the Ephesians, he expounds that. Ephesians chapter 4, 22-24. 20, you are taught to a former way of life. To put off the old self, which has been corrupted by deceived desires, by the deceitful desires. To be made new in the attitude of your minds, 
and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. This new self is to be like God. And like God means by like Jesus, because he is God become man. He is our role model. He is our example to follow. We can't be perfect by ourselves like Jesus, but we emulate his life. We imitate his life. Ephesians 5.1 says, be imitators of God. That's why if we really want to follow him, you have to study the four Gospels thoroughly, again and again and again to study, to understand how Jesus lived on this earth, when he walked this earth. His life on this earth, physical life on this earth, is the ultimate expression of the God life. God become man. And we are called to imitate his life. For that, he gives the resources that we all need. Verse 9. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. For the life he lives, he lives to God. As he was dead to sin, he, 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 the death he died, he died to sin. And then verse 11 says, in the same way, count yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now, he was dead to sin. He destroyed the devil on the cross. We are dead to sin. That's why should, sin should have no mastery over us. And we're going to see later on, the next few chapter, eight chapter especially, how we can have ultimate victory over temptations and sins that come our way. Because we, Paul is building up the case about his own struggle he had in the, with sin in 7th chapter of Romans, last few verses, and how we have found victory in Christ. It's going to be a very exciting passage. If you really want to follow the Lord, you have to take every verse here seriously and meditate. Not just listen to what I'm sharing right now. Go back and meditate. Let it go sink deep into your hearts and minds. And uh, the best way to grow in the Lord is to uh, hear and read the scriptures, meditate, obey. And then you find it goes deep into your hearts and minds. In the Old Testament, in Psalm 119, 1900, Psalmist writes, I am more inside than all my teachers because I meditate on your statutes. I am more understanding than all the elders because I obey your precepts. Meditate, obey. More insight, more understanding. So it's not just a morning Bible study on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Let it go deep into your hearts and minds. Meditate, not just memorize. Meditate. When you memorize, when the mind is involved. When you meditate, heart and mind is involved. And therefore, this is very powerful three chapters, six, seven, eight, where we find how we can have victory over things that hold us, where God has given the resources we need. And we can choose to live a new life in Christ. He helps us live this new life in Christ. Verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its evil desires. Don't let sin reign in your mortal body. The mortal body, which perishes, mortal, as well as mortal, in, in the body resides the sinful nature. The faculties of the body. We will come to 13 verse later on and see how uh, we, these things tend to get attracted to things of this world. And the mortal body, the sense of sight, the sense of speech, sense of taste, the sense of hearing, these are all faculties that we have which tend to get attracted to the stimulus in the world, the various parts of a body. The five senses we have are part of the body. And they get attracted to the stimulus or the enticement of the devil through the world in this world. Devil entices us, the parts of body, for us to be attracted to things of this world. In James chapter 1, 13 to 15, James writes, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil. Not to tempt anyone. Each one is tempted when by his own evil desire, evil desire, he's dragged away and enticed. 
When desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin is full grown, it leads to death. The evil one uses the things of this world to appeal to other faculties of our body. To get attracted to things of this world. Entice us. He shows us these things. Like he showed Eve the fruit, which is not supposed to eat. Fruit of tree of knowledge of good and evil. Good for food, pleasing to the eye, good for getting knowledge. She's focused on that fruit. And she got distracted from what God told her. So if you find in 2 Corinthians 11, chapter verse 3, Paul is sharing the concern he has for the church in Corinth. I'm afraid that just like Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, you mind will be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Mind going astray. Don't let it go astray. They will entice us, appealing to the mortal body, the senses of the body, parts of the body, to entice us with things of this world. We must master it by the power of God. Verse 13. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as uh, those brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. The parts of body basically means members of our body. The Greek word is mele, or mete, mete. Mete, mete means members of our body. I told you the various faculties, the, the tongue, the ear, the eye, the hand, legs, which you used to do things of the, uh, used to uh, offer to the world, to be used by evil, the evil one and indulge in sin, early offered to the world, now offered to God. This is the practical expression of offering our bodies in living sacrifices. The 12th chapter of uh, Romans, very, very popular, well-known verse this is, Romans 12.1, Paul writes, Dear brothers, in view of God's mercy, Offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is a spiritual act of worship. How do you offer a body a living sacrifice? The body has many parts. And here they explain very clearly in 13 verse. Third, Romans 6 30 is a practical expression of obeying Romans 12 1. The body is a living sacrifice you give to God. Eye is alive, ear is alive. Tongue is alive, early offered to sin, with the eyes they coveted, we lusted with the eyes, with the ears we listen to gossip and slander, malicious talk, loose talk we listen to, backbiting, with the mouth we spoke loosely, we pull people down, we didn't build them up, we praise God and we curse people also, unfortunately. That is wrong. So God said, God said, don't do that. So early we offer these parts to the world. Let me repeat that verse, verse one second. Romans 6.13. Do not offer the parts of the body or members of a body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those brought from death to life and offer the parts of the body to him as instruments of righteousness. So we have to actively, actively, proactively offer every part of our body to him as the instruments of righteousness. But earlier, with my eyes, I lusted after things of this world. Now let my eyes be focused on you, Lord, on your life. As I read the scriptures, the four gospels, how you live. Earlier, I looked at things of this world. Now let me read the scriptures with my eyes. I want to read the scriptures, Lord. Earlier I listened to gossip and slander and malicious talk. Now let me listen to your word. Earlier I spoke loose words. Now let me speak words of edification to glorify your name and edify your people. Among the parts of the body, the most troublesome part is the tongue. 
the book of James, chapter 3, what was 1 to 11, very powerful passage on how James writes, man can tame every, every animal, bird, reptile, no man can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil, full of deadly poison. And he compares the tongue in a human being to a rudder of a ship, a bit before a horse, and a spark that sets the whole forest on fire. A small part that controls a big entity. A small rudder of a ship controls the whole ship. A small bit controls the whole animal, horse, powerful horse. A small spark sets the whole forest on fire. In the same way, the tongue is a very small part of the body. It corrupts the whole person. And therefore, it's very important to understand while we can't tame the tongue, no man can tame the tongue, but praise God, God can tame the tongue. So what do you do? Give your tongue to God. Then we look at the passage. No man can tame the tongue. That becomes very discouraging for many people. But don't leave out God. He can tame it. So give your tongue to him. Tell him, Lord, all these years I've been speaking loose words. Now I'm giving my tongue to you, Lord. I can't tame it, Lord. I make my resolutions every January 1st. I make resolutions. I speak only good words. I won't hurt anybody. But before January end, I speak loose words. You take my tongue, Lord, and transform me, Lord. So we have to consciously, as I said, proactively offer every part of our body to him as instruments of righteousness, instruments that we use to do things that are right. And the motivation for that is the mercy of God. In view of God's mercy of a body's living sacrifice, the entire body, with different people, different things are a problem. Some people, most people, tongue is a problem, eyes are a problem. And uh, years are a problem. So everything give to God consciously. And then you realize he will change us inside out. Through the word, through the spirit, and through faith. Sanctification means being made holy. The word sanctifies us. John 17, 17. The spirit sanctifies us. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. And therefore, we have everything we need. Nobody can say, oh, it's very difficult for me. I cannot follow God. He has given you the resources. Receive it. We receive by grace. And therefore, when you cry out to God to be able to please Him, you can be sure God will answer. We are called to live, live to please Him. And to please Him, He gives us faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. 11th chapter of Hebrews, verse 6. So ask him faith. Lord, I can't do my own strength. Give me the resources you have for me, Lord. That every part of body early offered to sin. Now give to you, Lord. Change my entire personality, Lord. He will change us inside out. The same tongue that spoke loose words, they start speaking words of edification. Sometimes we have a weakness. Like this, my eyes are weakness, my ears are weakness. I like gossip, you know, it, 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 juicy gossip I like. That's my weakness. My eyes are weakness. I look at things and lust after things. My tongue is a weakness. I speak loose words. Now, usually people pray for the weakness to go away. Please pray, weakness becomes a strength, not just go away. 11th chapter of Hebrews, verse 34 says, through faith, our weaknesses are turned into strengths. Not the removing the weakness. Let the same weakness become a strength. If your tongue is a, your, your, the tongue is a weakness, you spoke loose words, now let it be a strength. Let it be a tongue that speaks words of edification. If you look at the fourth chapter of Ephesians, 29 and 30, we read, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. That could be a weakness, unwholesome talk. Rather, only was useful building up others. It will benefit those who listen. Speak words of edification, not just keeping quiet. When you speak loose words, we grieve the Holy Spirit. So whenever you find that you have weakness and people tell you a weakness, don't just say, Lord, take my weakness, Lord. 
please tell him, let this weakness of mine become my strength. Let my tongue become a strength now. So far, it was my weakness. I spoke loose words. I pulled people down. I gossiped. I slandered. Now let me start speaking words of edification to glorify your name and edify your people. So he changes the weakness and makes his strength. He was 11.34. Ask him to transform you that every part of your body is now glorifying God. Verse 14. For sin shall not be your master because you are not under law but under grace. God gives us grace to overcome sin. The grace of God motivates us to say no to sin. Titus 2.11 says, for the grace of God has appeared. Grace of God has appeared to teach us his note on godliness. Grace of God teaches us a note on godliness and worldly passions. It's not a license to continue in sin. As I shared on, on uh, Friday, there are some people who taste the grace of God, but these are godless people who change the grace as a license to continue in sin. Jude 4. Godless people are slipped in among you who change the, God, change the grace of God as a license to continue in sin. Whereas those who have tasted the grace of God will understand this grace will teach them to say no to ungodliness. So uh, sin is no longer your master. Because of grace, we have victory over sin. Now you're going to see slowly in the next two, three chapters, when you come to eighth chapter, how ultimately we have victory over sin, over the body. The Apostle Paul had a problem with the body. And he said, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from the body of death? Romans 7, 24, we find the victory in Christ. Then we come to the story. We go, we're building, he's building up the case for the fact that we must understand. If we choose to, with the resources of God, we can have victory over temptation and sin in our lives. Verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because of our fear are not under law but under grace? By no means. Shall we sin because we are not under law, under grace? We have got grace, so we keep on sinning? By no means. Verse 16. Don't you know that when you offer yourself to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey. Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. Whom are we slaves of? Are we slaves of sin? No way. We are delivered from sin, delivered from the evil one. Now we are called to be slaves of Christ, slaves to obedience. The calling everyone has, all of us as Christians have, is to obey Jesus. First Peter chapter 1, verse 2. We are chosen for the fullness of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling by his blood. That's our calling. We are slaves to obedience to Jesus, slaves to him. So forget about the past. Gone. We are dead to sin now. Like a dead body is dead to the world, we call it dead to sin. And alive for righteousness. Alive to live for Jesus and thereby obey him in everything he wants us to do. If we fail to obey him, we are the blood of Christ cleansing us. Ultimately, our hope to go to heaven is not our holiness. It's the blood of Christ. Very exciting, this next two sessions are going to be. So please read, do your homework and come on, uh, on Wednesday. And we'll go on from verse uh, uh, 17 from, uh, on, from Friday, uh, from Wednesday. God bless you all. And we will uh, we're going to find the next three chapters. Very, very exciting, I could told. It's very, very enriching, edifying, and building us up. God bless you all.